If you will, please be opening your Bibles to John, the 19th chapter. John, the 19th chapter. We're going to endeavor to read verses 4 through 15. While you're getting your Bibles open, there's something I need to say from class this morning. I told you in class this morning that I suffer from my lack of work as a student. I've suffered for 60 years because of that lack. My question, I, I told them at the class that I would ask this question or, or this parallel. Are we who are Christians, are we going to be willing to either suffer or enjoy heaven on the condition of what we have done or will do in the future? Because we will either have joy or we'll have punishment. John, the 19th chapter. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speak thou, uh, speak thou not unto me, but knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou would have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivereth me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not uh, Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down on the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbathah. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. This morning, I would like to us consider the cross. Pilate has tried his best to get the Jews to let him him release Christ. From this point on, the scriptures, all four gospels, talks about it. He sent him to be flogged and even brought him back after he was flogged. According to history, 60% of the people who were flogged didn't survive it. And many of those who did were maimed for life. Some of them lost their sight. Some of them lost teeth. They wore scars. They were were flogged to the point where their backs were cut down to the bone. This is the man we're going to talk about. And I think it's necessary for us to understand what he underwent or what he went through just before. I want us to talk about what he felt on the cross what he heard while he was hanging on that cross, what he saw while he was on that cross, and what he said on the cross. I also want you to think about something we're going to talk about here. You think about a man who has been flogged, beaten unmercifully, lied about, spit upon, It's horrible, the the description of how the Roman soldiers treated him before they led him to the cross. But this man, while he was hanging 
on the cross was busy. No, you didn't mishear me. He was busy. Luke 23 and verse uh, 33. And when they had come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right and the other on the left, as the brother read. What did he feel now while he was on that cross? Think about this. It, in our reading that I read, it said he had a crown of thorns. A crown of thorns was plaited and put on his head. You know they didn't just gently set it up there real nice and easy. He had a crown, a crown of, of thorns jammed on his head. That had to be tremendously hurtful. He had been flogged. He had been beaten. We talked about the fact that he survived it. They led him to the cross. He was weak and weary. He had been through a night of sleeplessness. When he woke up on Wednesday morning from a night's sleep, he was never again to sleep. Never again. And we're talking about Friday afternoon now. He was never to sleep again. He was tried three times by the Romans and three times by the Jews. But they found no fault, actually. They had to lie in order to convict him, the Jews did. Can you imagine being flogged like that and then having nails through your feet and your hands? Can you imagine the pain as you hang on that cruel cross? Back then, they didn't have sawmills where they sawed slick wood, where the surfaces were slick. They were all hand-hewn with a broad axe, most likely. Think about that back that was literally tore up against that hard and rough timber. In other scripture, it talks about, about the man who cleaned our Lord, that he got, they got splinters out of his back. But he felt horrible pain. He did. He was weary. He was worn. His body was suspended by spikes in his hands and his feet, as I said. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the horrible pain that he felt. But this is what he felt hanging on the cross for you and me as Christians. But if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. Do you know that he hung on that cross for you too? He hung on that cross for all mankind. We who call ourselves Christians are people who have availed ourselves of this forgiveness of God's sin, of for our sin to God. Christ did this for mankind, all men. He felt great pain. He felt a pain, but he also felt something else. He felt a loneliness of heart. Have any of you ever been lonely? I'm sure we have. But think about this man. Everyone he knew, everyone he knew forsook him. His apostles denied him. We know there was one standing close to the cross, because we'll talk about that. But everybody he knew forsook him. He had no one who loved him there to give him comfort. He was utterly alone. You say, well, now, Don, that's not true. Because the scripture says that God is always with us. But this is the exception, and we'll talk about that. Even God, even God forsook our Lord as he hung on that cross. So he was, he was weary physically, no sleep, beaten, nailed to a cross, forsaken even by, we know his mother, well, she was near the cross. But if you'll read the scriptures, it implies 
that two of the apostles were cousins to him. Ken folks, as you want to put it in Arkansas terms, they forsook him. So he felt weary and forsaken. What did he hear now while he was on the cross? In our mind's eye, let's try to look back through that time as we do when we take the communion. Let's look back and through our mind's eye. What did he hear? He was a man who was always been known to say, be of good cheer. He always had a word of comfort for people. Always. But here was the man now. Here was the man now that heard nothing but mockery. Matthew 27, verses 40 and 49 say this. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Imagine hanging there for mankind. Imagine hanging there crucified by his own creation. And they mocked him. These were the people who walked by him. Uh, supposedly the cross was near a, a well-used road. These people were coming by. Because at that time, anybody that was hung on the cross was considered a criminal. So these people mocked him. Our Lord, while he was hanging on that cruel cross. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come for him and have him. They didn't even want to him to have help. He heard the conversation. He heard the conversation of the malefactors, those who were hanging on that cross with him. If you will, turn your Bibles to Luke, the 23rd chapter, and let's start looking at verse 39. Verse 39. And the one of the malefactors which had hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And he indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. This last verse, this verse 34, uh, 43 is something that our, said, our Lord said while he was on the cross. This is what he said. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Even though he was hanging there in great pain, forsaken by all of his loved ones, he still had compassion. For this thief. These two who were hanging on the cross. At first they made fun of him. What did he see as he hung on that cross? As, we say, as, I, as I said. That it's generally believed. That the cross. The crucifixion took place. Near a well traveled road. What did he hear? And what did he say? I mean, what did he hear and see? Indifferent men. Roman soldiers. Now these are the same men that after he was flogged led him to that place to be crucified. These are the same men that laid him down on that cross. We don't know where there is hands and his hands were nailed to the cross, to the crossbar, and lifted up, and then his feet were nailed to the, uh, to the upright. We don't know for sure. But we know these men nailed, spike nails, through his hands and through his feet. And now they're sitting down on the ground. They're sitting down there, not worrying about him, not concerned whether he's 
hurting or, or the fact that he's been forsake, forsook by all of his friends and family. They were gambling over his few articles of clothes. And if you know anything about the scripture, there's no place in the scripture that says our Lord was affluent. There's no place in the scripture that says our Lord ever owned a house. I don't even know how many changes of clothes my Lord had. He couldn't have had much because he lived in abject poverty. I hope I don't wake that one a little bit. He lived in abject poverty, but here they were, gambling, literally gambling for his clothes, for the very clothes that he wore. If you will, turn with me to Matthew. Matthew 27. I'm fumble-fingered this morning. Matthew 27, verses 35 and 36. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him. He only had one piece of clothing that was of value. I'm going to say something that a lot of preachers don't say, but the scriptures imply it. Whatever clothes my Lord had on, they stripped him of it, David. This was part of, of, of the... There's a term I'm looking for. This was part of the punishment inflicted by be hanging on the cross. Our Lord had no clothes on. They literally took the clothes off his back, all the clothes he had, and they were gambling for it. says they cast lots. I don't know what it was, what it means to cast lots, but it was a gambling of some sort. They parted equally until they come to the one piece that our Lord owned. He owned a cloak that was woven in one piece. Then they cast lots. In other words, they gambled to see which one of the four would have his clothes. Can you imagine hanging on a cruel cross and watching men who had just nailed you to that cross, men who you helped create, gambling for the very clothes that was on his back? This is what part of what he heard. He heard malicious men. We read that about how they made fun of him, telling him, if you're the Christ, save yourself and save us. Until finally one of the thieves repented and asked for forgiveness. And our Lord said, this day thou will be with me in paradise. This is what he heard. I can't imagine... I can't imagine. I can't imagine. What else did he see? He saw his mother standing nearby with one of the apostles that he loved. If you will, John 19, verses 25 and 27. How the, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clorpus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he had loved, and he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he said unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the, that disciple took her into his own home. He saw his mother standing nearby. In the agony he had to be suffering, he saw her and he provided for her. He provided for her. What did he say? 
while he hung on that cruel cross. He gave seven utterances. He gave several seven utter, utterances. He said several things. The first three were spoken in the light because as the scriptures tell us about the sixth hour, there was a darkness came upon the earth. We don't know how dark it was. But it was so dark that all of the railing and the riot against him stopped. The scripture says it was silent. What did he say? I told you to start with, what did I tell you? The Lord was busy on the cross. He was busy. One of the things he said is in Luke 23 and 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's a man who suffered an excruciating pain. And his thoughts came to those who were crucified. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He wasn't asking God to forgive them for their sins. He was asking God to forgive them for being so ignorant as to crucify the Messiah they had been looking for for thousands of years. He cared about the ones who crucified. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He had a loving committal. He had a loving heart. He saw his mother on the cross. We read this already. He told his mother, Mother, here's a man, John. He didn't use the name. I'm paraphrasing. We read the scripture just a moment ago. John, here is John. From now on, mother, you will be with him. He says to his apostle, John, John, you see this woman? From now on, this woman is your mother. That's implying to be taken care of. According to secular history, she lived with him until she died. He thought about his mother. He took the time to take care of her. Then he cried with a lonely heart and said, Now from this ninth hour there was a darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about this ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lassa, Batha. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did I say a while ago, not only had all of, all of his family and friends forsaken him, our Lord said here that God himself had forsaken him. When he hung on the cross, he knew that God had forsaken him. Can you imagine being that lonely, being that forsaken? I get upset when Carol gets upset with me and goes in the other room. Here, all had forsaken him. He uttered a cry of need. John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures may be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. He knew that all things had been fulfilled. He said, I thirst. In the beginning of the horror of the crucifixion, they offered him sour wine with myrrh in it. It was used to help lessen the pain on those being crucified. But he rejected it. Think about this. He didn't want something to dull his senses. He took up on that great pain for mankind. But now all things had been fulfilled. And he said, I thirst. He 
he uttered a prayer of resignation. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Even though he just got through saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He now says, Father, I commend my life into thy hands. The last thing he said on the cross was a voice of triumph and relief. Can you imagine the relief it had to be to this man who hung on that cross? Approximately six hours, David, if I understand the scriptures. From nine o'clock in the morning Till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, our Lord hung on that cruel cross. Can you imagine the relief he had when he said, in a voice of triumph and with relief, John 19 30, Then saith, therefore, had, excuse me, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And now he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. The Jews didn't take his life. The Romans didn't take his life. We're responsible for him being on the cross, and we didn't take his life. He gave up. He gave up his life for you and me. He gave up his life for mankind. I made the statement a while ago, but it bears repeating. People who are outside of his body, those who have never obeyed the gospel, this sacrifice is just as much for them as for us. We are a lucky few, and if you think about the number of Christians in relationship to the world's population, we are a few. We few have had the common sense and love for God to accept his salvation through the act of believing that Jesus is the Son of God. We also, believe, we also as Christians, we were willing to Confess that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We made that verbal, that verbal commitment. Was it necessary that we did that to become Christians? Well, the scripture says if, he'll, if we'll not confess him before men, he'll not confess us before our Father which is in heaven. It's necessary to become a Christian. He was willing to die for us, we also, to become a Christian, we had to repent of our sins. And folks, the older you get, and I speak from experience, the older you get, the harder it is to admit we have sins. It's hard for us to admit that we haven't lived the kind of life that we should. You ask Carol, it's hard for me to tell her I'm sorry. But, we were willing to repent of our sins to want to change our lives. Again, as we said, we are willing to confess him that he is the Son of God. And then we were intelligent enough to know that God's word said, you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. There's no other way to get in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ except through the act of baptism. That's the only way the scripture says. Is there another way? He said, I'm the way, John 14, 6, said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Hearing him, hearing his word, believing in him, willing to 
repent of our sins, willing to confess him before men, willing to be baptized, is all a necessity. And thank God I had the good sense to know that I must do this to become a Christian, to have a hope of an eternity in heaven. If there's anyone in this room this evening or this morning and you're not a Christian, my question is why not? You just heard about what our Lord went through, how he purchased this forgiveness of sin for us. If you're here and you refuse to obey him, you're just as guilty of what happened to Christ as the Romans were. If you had need of our Lord's invitation, it's not my invitation, I'm just a messenger boy and a poor one at that. But he said, Nay, I tell you, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He's talking about more than just saying I want to change my life. He's talking about a lifetime, a lifetime of service to him. When's the best time to obey him? Now, this very minute. There's not a person in this room, there is not a person in this room that is guaranteed the next heartbeat. This pretty young lady down here is working on this bottle. She's the youngest lady in this building. But she's not guaranteed the next heartbeat. She is but one heartbeat away from eternity. But the good thing is, she's not reached the age of accountability. She doesn't know right from wrong. She has no worries. If you're here and you need the help of our Lord's invitation, whether it's to be baptized for the remission of your sins, or if you have problems, if we're Christian, we have problems, or we need prayer. There are men in this building who are willing and able to pray for you and with you. If you have needs, come forward as we stand together and sing. Jesus is tender.